Welcome to our workshop on clerkship grading committees. We've titled our workshop, When the Going Gets Tough, Look to Each Other, the Role of Clerkship Education Committees in Grading. My name is Cindy Lai, I'm from UCSF, and I'm joined by my colleagues Shireen Salib from Dell Medical School at UT Austin, and Bill Kelly and Paul Hemmer from Uniformed Services University. I had two students in my office yesterday complaining about their grade. They said, it's unfair, there's no obvious standard. You've got to help me here. What are you doing to assure that your grading is accurate and it's objective? All right, with that, let's kick off the workshop. Here's an overall agenda for the meeting. We're going to start with talking about why you should consider having a grading committee. And we're going to spend time comparing three different institutions committees for you to be able to compare and contrast give you an opportunity to brainstorm for your own uh, committee, cover some basic points about best practices and some pit pitfalls to avoid. And then our goal is that you leave with a plan to either start your own committee or to refine the grading committee that you do have. As uh, Dr. Kelly and I are federal employees, this is our standard disclaimer that the views that we're expressing today are simply our own and not those of the federal government or our home institution. So why a grading committee? Well, simply put, it's a way that we can all reach some agreement about what it is that we're all looking at. In the context of thinking about a grade committee, one of the things we'd ask you to think about is where conversations are happening or should be happening at different levels within our educational system. So our focus today is really at this point. Are conversations that are taking place at an education or a competency committee level where it's directors who are meeting, usually the clerkship director and site directors or associate directors, and perhaps some others, but it's leaders of programs. What takes place at those committees, though, should be informed by committees above them, typically curriculum committees or others at the school. Uh, but think about then below that level of discussion among the site directors. So what sorts of discussions and conversations are happening among your site directors and the teachers and the faculty at the sites? And even more importantly than what's happening between the individual teacher and the individual learner. And our point is the conversations that are happening at the level of a grading committee should be informed by what's above it and should inform what's taking place below it. And there's actually a theory about conversation and it's called conversation theory. Simply put, we need to talk. This is a depiction of some of the major aspects of, of conversation theory, and we're not gonna go into a lot of detail about it, but fundamentally what it's about is it's a way to understand and explain how we reach an agreement over an understanding and how participants through an exchange of ideas and action and transaction come to a shared language and an agreement about the goal. So what do we know about group decisions? Well, more than a decade ago, it was recommended no single individual should be making judgments about the competence of a trainee in isolation. And that we should be making performance and progress decisions by committee. When you do it by committee, there's typically a broader base of information that people have and they can draw on more perspectives. It gives you an opportunity to calibrate lenient and stringent raters. Now that at the level of a grading committee may be among the site directors, but it allows for consensus to begin to emerge and you can see how that might inform discussions below it. So individual, what are thought to be perhaps bad days by a trainee take on a different perspective when one might see a pattern of performance issues. But importantly, what happens at these meetings is that it's an opportunity to sit down and re to reflect, to engage in a reasonable decision-making process through conscientious and careful deliberation and in consideration of the entirety of the record. These three points are actually very important for process, uh, for students, for fairness, and it's actually the basis of Supreme Court rulings. So what happens when people meet? What gets, what gets better? Well, there's a wisdom of the group in judging progress of trainees. 
group conversations are much more likely to uncover deficiencies in knowledge and professionalism, and they tend to lead to better feedback for trainees. Group discussions can lead to better prediction of poor internship performance. What happens in these meetings is people engage in problem solving. Group assessments improve integrated reliability and reduce the range restriction. So people are more likely to use all aspects of a rating scale. There have been several studies that show in well-functioning groups that no individual dominates the discussion. And in fact, the most important individual is often the site director, which you'll hear about in subsequent presentations. And here's a reference for those of you who want to read in more detail about the science of effective group process. All right, and at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Cindy Lai, who is going to begin the discussion of comparing our three different institutions' grading committees. So, Cindy? I'm now going to talk about the grading context at UCSF so that we better understand how we structured our clerkship grading committee. We have two clerkship models. The first is the traditional a week inpatient block. The second is a year-long longitudinal integrated clerkship that occurs at our university-based site and at several community-based sites. Before 2019, our clerkships were graded on a tiered system, honors pass fail. Since 2019, we've been a pass fail clerkship model. Our grades are based on direct supervisor evaluations. In the medicine clerkship, we asked residents and faculty who worked with their medical students for seven days or more on the calendar to fill out an evaluation. The evaluations are criterion referenced and competency based. There are approximately 10 items that are based on the major competency domains. The competency domains are scored on a one to four scale and each domain has a box for comments from um, student supervisors. To pass the clerkship, students also need to pass the MBME subject exam. The pass threshold is two standard deviations below national average. If they don't pass the first time, they have a second opportunity. Over a decade ago, we didn't have a clerkship grading committee, and it was the site director who was responsible for determining their students' grades. There were a number of challenges with this system. When we individually graded our students, this led to inconsistent grading across sites and even within our own site. First, we tended to assign too many honors to our own students. We tended to think our own students were all above average, and so we gave out too many honors. Second, we had flawed memories of how we determined grades even within our own site from past clerkships, so we weren't being internally consistent within our own site. Finally, we lacked a shared mental model of grading criteria across this, all of our sites. And together, these challenges led to inconsistent grading for our students. In terms of the structure of our grading committee, we meet by Zoom for one hour, approximately three weeks after each clerkship block, which gives, gives us time to write a summary and turn in the grade prior to the LCME um, accreditation uh, deadlines. Our membership includes seven site directors and one clerkship director who also chairs the meeting. All of the members are voting. Our clerkship administrator also has an important role. And more recently, we've um, invited a core um, clerkship faculty member who has experience and expertise in DEI issues to join our committee member and to help us think through grading decisions using an equity lens. For example, some of our students have experienced microaggressions or significant life circumstances that may have impacted their performance on the clerkship. And we wanna be able to be thinking through their performance um, in an equitable and inclusive way. We have two major reasons for referral to our grading committee. The first is we review all students who are at the border of pass and fail. We also review students who have low clinical performance, even if we know that they will pass the clerkship. Of note, we don't review students um, if they do fine clinically, but fail the shelf exam. We have several goals with our grading committee. 
The major reason for having our grading committee is that we really want to develop consistency and equity with how we are applying grading criteria across sites. Another reason is that grading is very hard for our graders, and so the committee allows for peer support among site directors. The committee meeting is also very important to provide real-time faculty development so that we all develop a shared mental model of grading expectations. Finally, the grading committee is a wonderful opportunity for us to organically identify grading principles that naturally emerge from the cases that we are discussing. Over the next three slides, I'm going to explain the three major steps of our grading committee process. During the pre-meeting step, we do assign homework to our site directors. During this um, step, we ask each site director to submit a list of students who are at the border of pass and fail. The clerkship administrator then sends these student files to all grading committee members approximately one week before the grading committee. Each member prior to the meeting emails the site director with their preliminary and independent grade recommendation and rationale. This ensures that each site director has reviewed the file prior to the meeting and it helps reduce the possibility of groupthink at this stage of the grading process. During the actual meeting, each site director summarizes um, how each site director voted. During the meeting, each member has the opportunity to provide any additional input and perspectives, and we all have a rich discussion. We draw on prior cases, and we also identify emerging principles together. We vote on a grade, and if it's close, the site director along with the clerkship director makes the final grade determination. After the clerkship meeting, we ask each site director to draft the clerkship summary for the MSPE using an equity lens. Site directors ask themselves, are their summaries competency-based and focused on students' behaviors and skills? Are the adjectives used supported by description of behaviors? Are the summaries free of bias? Is the word count relatively consistent between students? Does the summary distinguish the level of performance on key student skills? For example, for our pass-fail clerkship, we still want to be able to distinguish between high-performing and lower-performing students. Finally, is any feedback needed for direct supervisors about how they wrote about their students? The final step of our process is that the clerkship director and the clerkship administrator review each site director's summaries. We edit them, and then we finally submit the grades. And then the site director does provide feedback, if needed, to supervisors about the quality of their written um, evaluations. In terms of perspectives on this grading committee process, we have found that this grading committee process has been very feasible and quite efficient. We meet for one meeting after each block. We've been able to have nuanced discussions about tricky grading decisions, including the impact of suboptimal learning environments on our students' performance, including what to do when students have experienced microaggressions or have experienced significant life circumstances that might have impacted how they performed on the clerkship. Together, we've developed a shared mental model of grading expectations. And through this process, we have also developed a lot of camaraderie with each other. And we have developed confidence and support in our grading decisions, which has definitely helped us when um, dealing with appeals that have occurred um, after the rotation. I'm now going to turn this over to Shireen, who will talk about the Dell experience with grading committees. In the next few minutes, I'm going to talk to you about our grading committee structure at Dell Medical School at UT Austin. So first, um, a brief review of the structure of our four-year curriculum, because we are a non-traditional school. Our students start with one year of an accelerated pre-clerkship curriculum, and then they enter the clerkship year during the second year where they complete all of their core clerkships during the second year, including the internal medicine clerkship, which is eight weeks of uh, inpatient uh, experience divided into two blocks, two four-week blocks. few words about our grading committee uh, background. So Dell Medical School is a fairly new school. And from the very beginning, we've had grading committees for all of our core clerkships. Our grading structure is criterion-based grading. It is not norm or um, curve-based. 
And all clerkships, including the internal medicine clerkship, have a three-tier grading approach, which is honors pass fail. The grading committee membership is composed of six total members. Uh, the members are intentionally diverse, and the clerkship director uh, chairs the grading committee. We try our best to be transparent regarding the grading committee process, and we share with the students the process of how the grading committee works. This is shared with the students during orientation, um, and we answer any questions that they have regarding the grading approach. Uh, all clerkship grading processes are also reviewed regularly by the undergraduate medical education curriculum committee at a medical school level. We use for uh, the clinical assessment, we use something called the clinical performance assessment form. And this assesses students on eight domains, uh, eight core competency domains. Uh, some of which are the traditional patient care, medical knowledge, practice-based learning, system, um, systems-based um, uh, practice, interpersonal communication skills, professionalism, leadership, and health equity. And we use a clinical performance assessment form, uh, which is completed by attendings and upper-level residents who worked with the student. Our grading approach is fairly straightforward. We uh, uh, use the uh, NBME shelf exam as well as students' clinical assessments, and each student is assessed by the grading committee uh, to either meets expectations or exceeds expectations, or in some rare circumstances does not meet expectations. Uh, we also take into consideration written assignments and performance on the OSCE, although the written assignments in the OSCE are uh, completion grades and are not, uh, are not assigned a grade per se. Some important things to keep in mind about our approach during the, in the grading committee. The grading committee reviews all clerkship students. There are, we do have separate grading committees for other UME courses, such as acting internship and the electives. The determination of whether a student exceeds expectations or meets expectations is both based both on numerical ratings and narrative comments on the clinical performance assessment form. And each student typically has around two to three pages of narrative comments uh, from the eight weeks uh, of the clerkship. The grading committee process, I'll take you through some of those steps. So first step is the clinical performance assessment form is completed for each student by every faculty member and senior resident that they've worked with for three or more days during the eight weeks of the clerkship. And then a grading packet at the end, at the completion of the clerkship, a grading packet is compiled for each student by the clerkship coordinator and is just, that grading packet is distributed to the grading committee members who review it before the grading committee meeting. Subsequently, the grading committee meets to discuss each individual student's performance. And uh, we go around and ask uh, um, every member of the grading committee uh, whether they thought that the student met expectations or exceeded expectations, and we have a discussion uh, around that. And then the grading committee discusses and arrives at a consensus for each student's clinical performance. A few other important notes about our grading committee approach. Students' performance on the NBME shelf exam is not shared with the grading committee members until after a clinical performance assessment has been agreed upon. Uh, and that's a, the, the intent of that is to avoid any um, bias uh, as we're thinking about their clinical performance. Additionally, faculty mentors, if there is a faculty mentor who works with a student, if they're present in the grading committee, they are asked to recuse themselves uh, if their student's assessment is being discussed. And then we also take uh, meeting minutes during the grading committee meeting. Those are documented and we save those in case questions come up subsequently. 
A few other additional details that are important. Students do not have access to the individual clinical performance assessment forms completed on them. However, to be fair to the students, if the grading committee notes some highly concerning comments on the clinical performance assessment forms, the grading committee will go back and review the formative feedback cards that the students were given during the clerkship to see if there was evidence that the student was given feedback about those concerns. And, uh, and if not, then the grading committee goes back to the faculty member who completed those forms to have a discussion. And we tend to lean uh, towards the side of uh, uh, um, giving the student the benefit of the doubt in those cases. And uh, after the grading committee meeting, the clerkship director completes a summative head form where the, uh, uh, the, the clerkship uh, director uh, synthesizes the comments of the grading committee and puts it into a summative head form. What about the release of the grades? The grades, including the summative or head clinical performance assessment form, are released to all clerkship students by the clerkship director during week four after completion of the clerkship. Only students who did not pass are contacted earlier than that if they did not pass the clinical component, which is rare, or if they did not pass the NBME exam. Students may appeal their grades within five business days. In cases of appeals, the grading committee reconvenes to, to consider the appeal. Appeals may then be escalated to the Associate Dean of Undergraduate Medical Education if needed. Our grading committee outcomes, on average, about 30% of our students end up with an honors. We've had few appeals uh, uh, in internal medicine over the years. We feel that the grading committee process enhances equity, and we have an, a fairly straightforward, streamlined approach. And uh, we regularly share best practices with other clerkships. Thank you so much for your time. Well, thanks, Shireen, for that great review. When I started as a clerkship director about 10 plus years ago, so proud and excited to have my learners across 11 hospitals in six time zones. And I'm still proud and excited, um, but I've come to greatly appreciate the challenges and the necessity, uh, which you know, of ensuring comparability across sites. One way we ensure comparability is through our grade committee uh, our grading framework and processes. We use the Reporter, Interpreter, Manager, Educator, a RHYME synthetic framework developed at our institution by Lou Pangaro uh, in the early 1990s. And to pass the clerkship, you have to be at a reporter level. Our grading is honors pass fail. We are criterion based and non compensatory. You can't do better on the exams and make up for clinical performance uh, or the other way around. And out of a 100-point system, 80 points come from frontline clinical supervisors. Our site directors uh, use conversation to solicit narrative comments, get a rhyme-based grade recommendation, and that's weighted based on time spent with the student, uh, teacher role, and uh, we weight the back end of the clerkship uh, more than the front end. Again, out of fairness, because our data shows students get better over time. We have a shelf exam. You have to pass it. Uh, and you get 10 points for passing, zero points for not passing. And uh, finally, a 10-point uh, paper-based, OSCE-like uh, clinical reasoning examination. If you add all this up and get 75 points or higher, that's an honors. Uh, but the other extreme, you know, where a student may, may have not met passing expectations, that's when our grading committee uh, comes in. Many reasons for a student to get to re refer to the committee. One is if any of their 14 plus teachers over 10 weeks uh, says they're not a consistent reporter, or maybe they say reporter, but the narrative comments say otherwise. Um, if they fail the shelf exam, we'll take a look at their record. Any professionalism concerns, any unexcused absence or an excused absence, like say COVID isolation of three or more days, we'll look at that record just to make sure the student had time uh, to meet those goals and expectations. Uh, and then of course we expect all students to complete required assignments. Here's an, uh, 
competency committee or grading committee from a few years ago. I'll talk over it while it uh, plays. Basically, we meet every five weeks after a 10-week block has ended. Now it's mostly on Zoom, uh, and we invite all of the site directors. We have GME representation. The medicine program director from Walter Reed up the hill comes down. We have pre-clerkship course directors, and of course myself and our chair of medicine, uh, but she does not vote. Uh, she can be present, uh, but she handles appeals later. Now, a lot of things happen before, during, and after our grading committee meetings. First, the student gets notified as soon as they meet criteria for review. That's done by the site director. I reach out to them as well. The student can't come to our meeting, but they do have the option, just the option, of submitting a statement. And we give the statement, the narrative comments, the grading evaluation forms to our committee members the week before the meeting, but we also include all the notes, the email correspondence, something we refer to as the entirety of the record. At the meeting, the site director summarizes some of that. There's a chance to ask clarifying questions and have some discussion and debate uh, back and forth. And then I call a vote around the room. Actually, it's two votes. The first is, did this student meet our clerkship goals and expectations, yes or no? And generally that means, do you think they need to come back for more clinical time? If that's the answer, then the grade is less than pass. It's a grade of fail. Uh, and then we have a second vote to determine what is the required remediation. It can include a lot of things. Uh, generally, it's do they need to come back for five weeks of clerkship time, five weeks of clerkship time, and then some sub I time? Do we need to see them at the sub I level? Uh, or do they have to do the 10 weeks of clerkship uh, over? It's individualized based on the discussion and that student. And then what I do is I issue the narrative and the letter. What's the difference? The narrative is that eight page report with all the teacher comments that we collected. Uh, the last paragraph of that goes into the Miss Beer Dean's letter. Now the letter I send to the student has very granular instructions, uh, such as, you know, you have to do this extra clinical time, you know, book it uh, before four months prior to graduation, just so we don't delay graduation. Uh, or you have a grade of incomplete and have to retake the shelf exam, you have six months to reach out to me and schedule it. Uh, basically, it's putting the responsibility uh, on the student. Now, appeals go to our chair of medicine through me, and it has to be requested within 14 days. And uh, the chair person can basically uh, override us or turn it back to our committee for review or just agree uh, with what our committee says. And that's it. There's no higher level appeal process. And I want to emphasize our process, our grading is performance-based. So in the rare event, say we find some uh, week 10, there was some distraction, extracurricular stressor, or a medical condition uh, that our student experienced, we're going to take care of that student for sure, get them whatever they need, but then they'll come back and uh, do remediation. We're not going to change a grade to fail to pass just because of that dis distraction. It's performance-based, and I look forward to our discussion uh, on that. A couple outcome slides. You know, we've done this study about 10 years apart. If our grading process, conversation, rhyme, and our grading committee identifies a learner as needing remediation, uh, not passing the clerkship, that individual is uh, much more likely as an intern to get a low program director rating or fail a step exam uh, or both. And put another way, if our process identifies the student as having not met expectations, that student is five to seven times more likely to have problems later compared to all of the other grading processes of all of the other clerkships uh, at our institution uh, combined. In addition to that, uh, every year, uh, Paul and the group does about 40 pages of statistics looking for variation in the grading outcome. You know, for example, do uh, males get different grades than females? If you're a Navy student at an Army hospital, does your grade suffer? What about time of year? What about whether you do clinics or wards first or last? Um, and certainly across sites, is there a difference in grades? Do we find things? Absolutely. If you never find things, why do you bother looking? But this empowers us, the data, to go to the sites, modify performance, and then uh, remeasure that. Uh, so it's an ongoing uh, process, a garden that needs constant attention, uh, but we are very thoughtful about it because it comes down to fairness. We have to be fair to society. If we say the student passed, they're ready for internship. You know, or uh, And we have to be fair to students that whatever site they're at, they're going to be treated uh, fairly. And then uh, we also have to be fair to our faculty and respect their grade recommendations. 
but it's that order, fairness to society, student, and faculty. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Paul. I just want to mention some of our fun clips that we used on our break at the live workshop. Reviewing the challenges and expectations for a grading committee will be included in the QR code uh, at the end. Paul, over to you. Well, let's talk now a little bit about best practices and pitfalls. So underlying what are best practices and groups has to do with the fact that trust needs to be built in the group. And this was a scoping review that was published in 2019 with a definition of group trust being a group directed willingness to accept vulnerability to the actions of the members based on the expectation that members will perform a particular action important to the group. So I think there are a couple important points here and I highlighted them, that there is a vulnerability in a group process. And so it needs to be a safe place but there's actually an expectation that people should have of one another to actually be participating in reaching a goal. So there was a study at UCSF, and Dr. Lai was part of this, on group decision-making, and it was a qualitative study of eight grading committees. And some of the themes that emerged is members of the grading committees admitted that they struggled with the quality of the assessment data that they were looking at. They saw some threats to the assessment process, one of which was sort of a passive approach to bias, is that when bias was evident either in what they were reading, in the narratives of training performance, or even what might be emerging in the group process, um, that if people were passive about it, not taking taking it head on, uh, that that was a threat to the entire process. And also they were all guarding against what was called groupthink, uh, is that you saw a quick video of that earlier, but people all sort of moving to sort of go along to get along. They felt that the best discussions happened when individual members engaged in advanced preparation before the meeting. And so that each member would come to the meeting having already an idea in mind about that trainee's performance, any issues that might have come up, and what they are seeing as a potential outcome. And they saw that as very instrumental in trying to come back group thing. They saw the benefit to the committees and that it provided a forum for faculty development for educational leaders, and that it led to more fairness in the assessment process for students, and also better consistency across different clerkship sites. So what are some of the strategies that they recommended in this article? So as I mentioned just a, a moment ago, independent member pre-review. Materials are provided in advance of the meeting with an expectation that everyone will review the materials, come ready to discuss. People need to be willing to share their perspectives. There needs to be a safe environment in which all members are expected to contribute and to share what's on their mind. There should be a goal that you're trying to build a case for every student to succeed. Some of that might require additional clinical time, but the goal is helping the student improve. They also felt that what was one of the things that was very important was that the site director share contextual information with the group. I mentioned this in the beginning of, about one of the studies, and, and in fact, one of the most influential aspects of group decisions and highly functioning groups is the perspective that the site director brings to help put comments into context. Members of the group need to acknowledge and to address personal bias, um, either up front or if they feel it emerging during the course of the discussion. Everyone should be working towards a refined and a shared mental model through ongoing discussions. Um, and that part of this process should lead to continuous improvement. What are ways that not only the committee can get better, but how the uh, clerkship program can improve at each of the sites? So some considerations for you. If you're just starting a committee, or even if you have started one, think about the membership. Most groups work well if they've got about seven to 12 members, but think about who you want to have on that committee. Is it only people who are involved with clerkship? Should you have people who have different views, either from pre-clerkship or post-clerkship? Um, should you have someone who is out there explicitly to represent society? 
And do you want to create a group that might have some divergent views? Other th the things that you're striving for is having a very explicit discussions about what your shared mental model of success looks like. If people are willing to share information, having a structure to the discussion so people know what to anticipate. As we discuss each student, here's the process, here's the way we're going to go through it. So again, people have a chance to prepare for that. People should be willing to offer their perspectives, um, but also if someone's running the committee meeting, should be able to solicit perspectives as well and be willing to engage with healthy disagreement, civil discourse. Fundamentally, this is about encouraging conversation among the members of the committee. That allows people to elaborate on their own thoughts and on the student records and the exchange of ideas. This goes all the way back to the slide I showed at the beginning about conversation theory. Some other guidance. Know your local process and processes and make sure that your committee adheres to your School of Medicine policy memoranda or other guidance. Think about how the grades are being assigned in the clerkship and what role your committee has in that. What will the appeals process be? You heard about different ways that different schools are doing the in appeals process. And if you're starting a committee anew, does it need some sort of formal approval? Does this have to go through your curriculum committee? Does it have to go through the dean's office? And then think about what do you want your committee to do? Again, you heard different perspectives. Do you want them to be determining grades for all of the students? Do you want them to be doing it for simply some of the students, those about whom there might be concerns? And how does your committee's work then inform program evaluation? How do you know that the work of your committee is successful? Give careful consideration to who should be a member of the committee. Build trust through an ongoing conversation. It's this vulnerability in the group process, but an expectation of people willing to exchange their thoughts. And be, have a focus to always be improving. So in summary, there is wisdom in the group. When you engage with these sorts of committees, you will find gaps, problems, holes in your program of assessment. That's to be expected, and it's an opportunity to make things better. Discussions, conversations are invaluable. In these discussions and conversations, focus on the performance of the trainees, what was observed, and try to avoid making a diagnosis about the trainee. And have courage. On this final slide, here's a QR code that links to a resource folder that has all the worksheets that we distributed during the course of the workshop, as well as some key references. And I've also included all of our email addresses here. And thank you very much for your attention.